Last week, my family and I went on a little road trip down to a little tiny town in Tennessee called Huntington, Huntington, Tennessee. It's just a little tiny, little tiny town, about 4,000 people in between uh, Nashville and Memphis. And we, we tried to get out early in the morning. We, the goal, we, have a, we always have a projected departure time from our house, and then we have an actual departure time from our house, and there's usually some, some disparity between those two times. And for us, we had a, a 10 a.m. Depa- projected departure time, but we also have four kids, and it was also Christmas morning. So uh, around 2 p.m., we rolled out of the house and <clears throat> got on the road and started heading down to Huntington, Tennessee. And the, the, the problem is that, you know, it's a four-hour trip, but if you got little kids, there are, there are extra stops. There are little stops here and there, little potty breaks and pit stops and food breaks and this and that and whatever. So it's about a six-hour trip for us. We usually just add a couple hours to all of our trips. And so we're driving down there. And as we're driving, of course, the sun goes down and it gets dark. And I don't know if you've ever driven on backcountry roads out in the woods at night, but it's kind of hard to know where to go. So normally, like, a decade ago, I would have pulled out the trusty road atlas and I would have tried to find a light and pulled over at a gas station and tried to trace my way. But we had a friend with us in the car this time and her name is Siri. I don't know if you've met her, but um, she has become my, one of my best friends. And she, she, she can just kind of tell you where to go. So all you have to do is let Siri know your ultimate destination, let her know where you're trying to get to, and she will get you there. And it, there, there are going to be times on that road, there were times for me where I'm going, is this really the right way? Because, I mean, we are on some gravel. We're going around some corners. We're on some terrain I've never seen before. This is unfamiliar territory. I'm not quite sure what's going on. But as long as Siri knows our destination, as long as she knows where we're trying to get to, she's going to get us there. In our lives, we have this experience all the time. We, we wander down roads that are sometimes unfamiliar to us. We sometimes go down paths that we've never gone down before. We sometimes are forced with, to make decisions that we just never had to make before. We're going down new territory. We're going down an unfamiliar path. But as long as we know where we're trying to end up, as long as we know our final destination, as long as we have a sense of what God's vision for the ultimate destination for our life is, the Holy Spirit is going to help navigate us down that path. As long as we have an understanding of God's vision for our relationship, there are going to be times where, man, we're just quite, not quite sure where to go or how to make that decision. But if we have a vision for what God wants for us, his destination for our relationship, then he's going to help us navigate down that path. On our career, in our career or in our school or in our life, there are going to be times where we're, we're having to make decisions that we've never made before. But if we can have a clear sense of what God wants for us, the, the, the ultimate goal, the final destination, then we can navigate those difficult, dark, and, and sometimes confusing terrains and paths because we have a vision for what God wants for us. So today I'm titling this message, Vision Sunday, Where We Are Going. Because not only does it matter for you and I individually in our lives to have a sense of where we're going, but it matters for a church to have a clear sense of where God is taking us. Where does God want us as a church community, as a family, to go? What, what is the path that he's taking us on? All of you have friends or family members, or maybe some of you have been in the position in your life before where you didn't know what the end goal was for your life. You didn't know where God was taking you. You didn't have a sense of where you were going. And we all have friends and family members like this where you go, gosh, right now they're just wandering. They're just, they're, they're, they're directionless. They're not, they're not going down a path. They're not actually getting anywhere. We've all experienced that either ourselves or with somebody close to us. But as, a, as, a, as an individual and as a church, we've got to have a sense of vision for where we are going. In fact, Proverbs puts it like this. It says, without a vision, the people perish. If you don't have a clear sense of where we're going, then you'll just end up on the ditch somewhere. You just end up off the path somewhere. You've got to have a clear sense of where you're going so that you can allow the Holy Spirit to guide you there. God spoke to a, a prophet about 700 years before Jesus. And what he said to this prophet, I love, it was the prophet uh, Habakkuk. And he said this, write down the vision, Make it plain so that those who read it can run with it. 
Not only do you need to know the vision, you got to make it plain. It's got to be clear. Write it down, make it plain so that those who read it can run with it. So this morning, I'm not going to preach in my normal style. We're going to take some time and it's going to be more of a teaching and informational session about who we are, where we're at, and where we're going. What is our mission? What is our vision? What are the values that guide you, City Family Church into 2018? And I would love for you to write this down and make it plain and put it on your refrigerator. He didn't put that in the scripture, but that's what I'm going to add. Put it on your refrigerator or in your vanity mirror so that when you read it, you can run with it. So we're going to have a couple greeters, if you wouldn't mind greeters, to come to the front with some pens and some uh, extra sermon notes. If you need a pen or a sermon note, uh, you can just put up your hand. Our greeters will come to the front, then they'll look, turn around and look at you. Um, and just raise your hand if you need a pen or a sermon note uh, and join us in writing this down uh, this Sunday, the last Sunday of the year. So I'm going to start with our mission. What is the mission of U City Family Church? Our mission is to bring people and God together in love. To bring people and God together in love. Now notice this is a two-part a two-part mission. One part is a vertical axis. We are bringing people to God. We are getting people and God together in love. This is a vertical axis. We come, we pray, we sing, we, we preach, we read the word, we, we praise, we worship because we want people to connect with God. We want to move beyond religion and get into a, a, a real relationship between people and God in love. The other axis of this mission is horizontal, to bring people together in love. Now notice, it's not just bringing people together. A lot of places bring people together. Walmart brings people together. Uh, Starbucks brings people together, but we need to bring people together in love. This is a two-fold mission statement. We are bringing people closer together with God, and in so doing, we are bringing people closer together with each other in love. In uh, 1962, December 27, Dr. Martin Luther King delivered a speech down in, uh, uh, in Nashville, I believe. And in this speech, he called it the ethical demands of integration. And in this speech, what he, was, what he was really drawing out is there's a distinction between bringing people together physically and bringing people together in love. Bringing people together just physically, he called desegregation. This is just where, where people from different backgrounds and ethnicities and races or whatever are in the same place, right? And, and, and that's, that's, that's step one. But the higher ethic, he said, is true integration. That's bringing people together in love. So you're not just physically together, you're spiritually together. And here's the speech that he gave. I got an excerpt and this just blows my mind. I love the way he put it. He said this, he said, we don't have to look very far to see the pernicious effects of a desegregated society that is not integrated. In other words, it, we don't have to look far to see that just having people in the same room together or in the same city or in the same school or in the same office place without a true affinity for each other, without a true love for each other, it doesn't have a good effect. The pernicious effect of a society that is desegregated but not integrated. He said it leads to physical proximity without spiritual affinity, without a, a, a real sense of love. It gives us a society where men are physically desegregated and spiritually segregated, where elbows, he said, are together and hearts are apart. It leaves us with a stagnant equality of sameness rather than a constructive equality of oneness. He said, if we really want to, if we really want to live out the gospel, it's about bringing people together with God in love and then bringing people together with each other in love. In fact, at the end of Jesus's ministry, he prayed and he prayed for you and he prayed for me. And his prayer was this. He said, father, I pray that my followers would be one, even as you and I are one. You in me and I in you. I pray, Father, for complete unity among those who are following me. I'm praying for oneness. I'm praying that, that we would become one. And then the question immediately for us arises, how do we become one? How do we actually have spiritual affinity? How do we move beyond just physical proximity? How do we move beyond just, hey, we're in the same building or, hey, we're in the same city or the same school or the same job, right? How do we move to that? There was a lawyer that, that asked Jesus a question. The lawyers always get it figured out in the gospels, by the way. Um, 
not really. But, but they, they asked Jesus a question, and they were trying to stump him. And the lawyer said, uh, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Of all the commandments, what's the greatest? And what I love about Jesus, he always gives you more than what you ask for. He said, I'm going to give you a two for one. You ask me for the greatest, I'm going to give you the greatest and the second greatest. How about that? He said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the greatest commandment. Everything. You love God with everything. The second greatest is very similar to that. You love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, on those two commandments, all the law, all the prophets, all the rules, all the commandments, all the Bible, all the scripture, everything hangs on those two commandments. You drill down on those, everything spills out from that. It's a vertical, it's a horizontal. We love God completely. We love each other unconditionally. That is the vision that Christ has for us. How do we achieve the mission? We love God completely. We love each other. We love you unconditionally. Who is you can go to that next slide, Naveen, and this, this says our vision statement. We love God completely. We love you unconditionally. Who is you? It's you. All right? That's the definition. It's you. That's how we do it. Uh, there was another prophet about 800 years before Christ, and his name was Hosea. And God gave Hosea, I think, probably the strangest premarital advice of any premarital advice in the history of premarital advice. And, and, and there's a lot of premarital, if you've, ever, if you've ever been married or you are married or you're about to get married, a lot of people have a lot of advice for you. I don't know if you noticed that, but they'll, they'll, you know, they'll, unsolicited, they'll just tell you how you should do it. And then you have a baby and then they really start telling you. So, but, but God gives Hosea this really bizarre premarital advice. And I do some premarital stuff every once in a while, counseling this. This is not the kind of advice that I would have given, but it's God. So, you know, he's going to do it the way he wants to do it. So he tells Hosea, he says, Hosea, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into town and I want you to find a prostitute to marry. Now, when I said this in the first service, the teenagers in the front row all went like this. What? I mean, they like, they literally, one of them was like, whoa, said it out loud. We didn't record it. I wish we had had a record. I'm like, that's how we get teenagers' attention. We give them the Bible. And um, God tells Hosea, he said, I want you to go marry a prostitute. I want you to marry someone who you're pretty confident is not going to be faithful to you. Now, if I'm Hosea, <laughs> I'm going, is there a plan B in this premarital situation? No, God says, I want you to go. So Hosea goes and he marries a prostitute. Her name is Gomer. And, and he marries her. And of course, as you might expect, she's not faithful to him. She runs out on him. And God says, go get her and bring her back. So he does. She runs out and go get her and bring her back. She runs out, go get her and bring her back. Jose is like, God, can you, what are we doing here? God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell my people that this is the way I love them. You're Gomer, we're Gomer. No matter how many times you run out, God's coming back after you. God's coming back after you. Is there, are there repercussions? Yeah. Is there judgment? Yeah. Is there pain that arrives and derives from sin? And yes, but God keeps coming after us. He keeps coming after us and brings us back in. That's the kind of love that he has for us. That's why he told uh, uh, Hosea to marry this woman because he wanted to give a physical demonstration of the kind of love that he has for you and the kind of love that he has for me. And the only way to respond to that kind of unconditional love is with complete love. So we love him completely. We say, God, I am not worthy of the love that you have shown me. Your grace, your mercy, your love far exceeds what I deserve. And so my response to you is complete and total love. I love you with my heart, soul, mind, body, spirit. I give it all to you. Everything that I have, everything that I am is yours. And I love you completely. And then I have to look at those around me and see that you've showered your love on them the same way you showered it on me, which requires me to love them the way you love me. So I've got to love you completely. And then I have to love others unconditionally. If we could get two commandments right, everything would be squared away, right? There are only two. Love God completely. Love others unconditionally. 
Some of us, that's, that's just a, a thing that we need to begin to practice as a spiritual discipline. And we're going to have opportunities to do that. We're going to have our life groups starting out in, at the end of January. We're going to be launching life groups. That's an opportunity for you to grow together in love. Loving God completely. Loving each other unconditionally. Getting involved. You want to learn to love somebody unconditionally? Get in a life group with somebody who's a little ornery. And then you start to learn how to love unconditionally, right? It might be you. You might be the ornery one. If you don't know the ornery one in the group, it's you, okay? <laughs> so that's what we're going to do in January. There's provide an opportunity to do that and to start loving God completely and loving one another unconditionally. So that's the vision. That's the destination. That's the goal. That's where we're going. How do we get there? What are the paths? What are the values? What do we focus on in order to get there? The first one is this. We as a church are Christ-centered. We are Christ-centered. That means everything we do is about him. Everything we do is about Christ. When I do premarital counseling, what I, one of the things that I love about it the most is that usually when a couple is that fresh in the relationship, it's that new, there's this kind of, there's this kind of freshness to the love. You know, and they're excited about each other. If you've ever been in love, even if it was puppy love, even if you were a teenager, you remember that experience of when you first fell in love with that person. You would wake up thinking about them. You would go to sleep thinking about them. You, were, you would get distracted during the day thinking about them. You would, want, you would, you would try to figure out how to please them, how to, how to honor them, how to build that relationship. Some of you are looking at me like, I don't remember that. It was a long time ago. But... Think back. That's, 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 that's the kind of love that I, I, I love to see because it's, that, it's just like, it's like fresh fallen snow. It's just, like, it's just pure and it's just that, that first true love. As, as a church that is Christ-centered, what it means is that we get back to our first love. It means that we start pursuing Jesus with everything we've got. We remember him. We think of him in the morning. How do we please it? Before we go to bed, Christ is on our mind. In our interactions at, at work, it, we're, we're trying to be guided by Christ. In our interactions with our friends at school, we're guided by Christ. In our interactions with our spouse or with our loved one, with our family member, with the people that we like, with the people that we dislike, with the ones at the dinner table with whom we disagree, at the ones we don't want to see next Christmas, and we're going to take us a year to recover from the last conversation that we had with them. Those are the ones. So we've got to learn to love them unconditionally. We put Christ first, and, and, and in so doing, here's what happens. In loving Christ, in putting him first, in making him center, we actually become outward facing. Loving Christ doesn't mean that we close off. Becoming Christ centered doesn't mean that we turn our back on the world. It actually means that we, we, we turn to face the world. We start to look out at other people. My father used to say, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. You know, that's, that's, the, that's what it means to be Christ centered. It means that we start to open up and we become outward facing. We start looking at other people and thinking, gosh, how can, how can I help them experience what I'm experiencing? How can I draw them into the relationship that I'm having with God? How, do I, how can I serve that person? How can I bring a, a greater sense of, of hope and peace and joy into that person's life? I don't know if, you, if anybody likes the, the fast food restaurant Chipotle. Any, any Chipotle fans out there? A few Chipotle people. I love Chipotle. There used to be one right next to uh, right next to the Tivoli here, and they moved, and, I, and it really, really messed up my, my mojo, my food mojo, so, uh, because I would go in there all the time, and one of the things that I loved about them is that when you would walk in the door, somebody would say, and it could be a custodian, it could be a line cook behind the grill, somebody would be like, hey, how's it going? Welcome to Chipotle, like right when you walked in the door, and I remember the very first time it happened, I, I was a little startled, because I thought, oh, I thought, oh, maybe I, I don't know, maybe I know this person. Maybe we went to high school together. I don't know, you know, like, oh, hey, how, how are you, you know? Welcome to Chipotle, they said. And I'm like, thank you. Welcome. Thanks for working here. And, you know, and we're, then I realized that they were doing this to everybody. And I thought, oh, I see. This is, this is how they greet people. And the thing about it is that they're focused on what they're doing, right? They're focused on they're making burritos and they're making tacos and they're making you know, quesadillas and they've got, you know, they're focused on chopping the vegetables and the avocado and the chicken and the meat and the salsa and the, you, are you hungry? Are you hungry? And they're getting it all, they're, they're focused on that, but they know they can make the best burrito in the world, but it doesn't matter if they don't pay attention to the guy walking in the door. Doesn't matter. 
As a church, becoming outward facing or being outward facing means we are take very seriously our doctrine, our beliefs, our teaching, our, our practices, but none of that matters if we're not paying attention to the man or the woman walking in the door. In fact, Jesus put it like this, don't wait for him to walk in the door. He said, go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in. Go, he said, into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. He said, I want you to be outward facing. Everything you do doesn't end with you. The Christian life only starts here. It doesn't end here. It ends by going outward to other people, to serving other people. If you want to be a part of an outward facing team or an outward facing church, get involved. Find a way. We, our dream team, we're doing our 401 today after service. If you're not on that team, come and be a part of that team and start facing outward, like greeting people or making them coffee or being on the sound team or set up or find a way to serve somebody. That's, that's what we are about. We're about outward facing, Christ-centered, outward facing. And we don't only just do it, we do it with excellence. We are excellent in serving. We are excellent in serving. We don't just, you know, just kind of do it and do our duty. And we want to go, the Bible talks over and over about whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. Do it as unto the Lord because it's Christ that you are serving. When you are serving one another, you're serving Christ. In as much, he said, as you've done it unto the least of your brothers, you've done it to me. When you give your brother a, a glass of water in my name, you've served me, he said, right? He said, I, I, anytime you're serving somebody, you're serving the Lord Christ. So do it with all you've got. I got an email last week that I just, it was so heartening. It was so powerful. It was a visitor who came and experienced somebody serving her and her family with absolute excellence. And I just want to read the email to you because it's just inspiring and I love it. She said this. She said, I found your church through a local recommendation, friend of a friend type situation. She said, we definitely plan on coming back. I also want to make one quick call out. She said, I just moved here from Florida and I'm in the process of finding a church home for my family. It's very important to me that my children have this experience and that they have fond memories of church when they grow up. With that said, Jason, Jason Fry, in the children's ministry was so wonderful when we dropped off our children, my three children and my friend's one child. She said, I was nervous about it and worried about leaving them, but he was so kind. My baby began to cry when I left and he stayed with her, which was reassuring for me. When I came back to get them, he was there and brought them to me. I just felt like Jason and everyone in the children's ministry took my kids seriously. The weekends are the most important amount of time I get to spend with my children. So I take the activities for which we, we will be separated very seriously. This congregation, she said, already showed me it cares. My kids aren't just an afterthought, and I'm not just another face in the pew. Jason especially was a big part of making us feel welcome. I felt compelled to share my feelings. Thank you for listening. How about that email? Is that awesome? Here's why. Here's why. Somebody came and somebody cared. Somebody paid attention to the person walking in the door. Somebody said, I want to go. Your baby's crying. I want to go above and beyond. I'm going to take, the, take that baby. I'm going to you know, hold that baby. And then I want to make sure that you know that we're taking care of that child, right? We're, we're going to serve with excellence. We're creating an environment where people feel comfortable and they, they can let their guard down a little bit and they can receive what God has for them. That's what that's about. It's about creating an environment where people feel comfortable enough to open up their hearts for a minute, open up their mind for a minute, let the word of God fall in, drop into their heart and take root. That's how we do it. And here's what happens when we do that. When we care for one another, when we love one another, when we love each other unconditionally, when we serve each other unconditionally, we hit value number four, and that is we become unified in our diversity. We become unified in the, the wild multiplicity of, of the way we are as people coming from all backgrounds, all walks of life. We become unified in our diversity. A lot of people ask me, as a pastor, they're like, how does this church, you know, how did this church become so diverse? 
You know, most churches are not like this. How, how, why are there people from different ages and different um, socioeconomic backgrounds and education levels and, and, and ethnicities and races? Why, why are all these people, how did this come together? Like they want the secret sauce. Like how, do, how does that happen, right? But it happens when you have a core belief that at the heart of the gospel, we are bringing people and God together in love. It's not a side dish in the gospel. It's the full meal. It's the whole thing. Bringing people and God together in love. It's not a trend. It's not, a, it's not a, some hip thing to do. It's what Jesus calls us to. It's at the core of his gospel. It's at the core of his ministry. If you look through the gospel, you find that the longest conversation that Jesus had recorded in the Bible with anybody in the entire Bible is between him and and a woman from a different ethnicity, a different culture, different race, different tribe, different religion than him. You find in Acts chapter 8 that, that Philip, one of the great evangelists, was taken out of the north and brought to the south because there was a man, an Ethiopian, leaving Jerusalem and heading back down to the continent of Africa. And God said, no, 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 Philip, come and catch him before he goes down because I want to make sure that this is spreading over, over there in Africa and in Ethiopia. When, when Peter in Acts chapter 10 <clears throat> is sort of like just keeping things to himself and kind of staying in his own lane and staying in his own box, God comes and says, hey, Peter, you're being a bigot. I'm gonna break you wide open. I want, to go, I want you to go into the house of this group of Italians that you don't like, and I want you to go minister the gospel to them. And he does. He goes into Cornelius' house, and they get baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, and it just, it just spreads. So at the very core of this, God is saying, my mission, Jesus is saying, my mission is to break this thing wide open, to bring all people together as a family, as one. We are a family, as one, sons and daughters of God. And in fact, in Jesus' final act, his crucifixion, the moment he breathed his last, the moment he gave up the ghost, his arms are spread, he dies on the cross. The scripture says that there was a thick curtain between uh, the holiest of holies where God's presence, his Shekinah glory was encased, and then the rest of the world. And Jesus, when Jesus died, when his, when his body was broken, when his last breath was breathed, the scripture says that that veil was torn right in two, from top to bottom, split wide open. Why? so that the whole world could come together in Christ as a family, could follow him, could find him. No matter where you come from, no matter what your background is, no matter what tribe, culture, creed, or race you come from, you come together under Christ as one in family. We are unified in diversity. That is at the core of the gospel. So the question for you and I is this. What if we apply this vision to our life? To your life? What if you apply the vision of bringing people to, and God together in love? What if you apply that in your very, very core of your being? What if you become a, a, a Christ-centered person? What if you become an outward-facing person in 2018? Not concerned about self, but opening up and seeing other people and trying to serve other people. And what if, you, what if you strive to do that with excellence in every area of your life, in your school, on your job, in your home, with your kids, with your, you know, your, your families and your friends? What if you, what if you, and then what if you decide that at the very core of your being, part of your goal is to become unified in the diversity of the situation that you happen to be in? What does your life start to look like? I, I say that in 2018, we as a church family, we press into this bringing people and God together in love, loving God completely, loving each other unconditionally, because of that starts small. That started small here. That started with a handful of people. And then a year later, it's 100 people. And then 200, 300, 500. I mean, the, the, way this thing, the way this thing works is it transforms lives one at a time. And it spreads. That's the whole thing with the gospel, is you take this vision that Christ gave to us, and it spreads across the world. That's the whole goal. That's the vision of Christ. That's what it means when Jesus said, I pray that your kingdom would come where? On earth, as it is in heaven. You know what his kingdom looks like in heaven? You know what the final destination looks like? You know what the final goal is? The final data points that are plugged into the GPS? John, the apostle, tells us in the last book in the Bible, in Revelation, he said, I had a vision, I had a vision of the very end goal. And here it is. 
Here's what it looks like. He said, every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every language group, every people are gathered around the throne and they're saying God is our salvation. And they're worshiping Christ together as one. That is the goal. That is the destination. So 2018, U City Family Church, we plug that coordinate into our GPS because that is where we are heading. Amen. Let me pray for you. Let's close our eyes and let me close us out. Father, I come before you right now. Gratitude, gratitude for what you've done in our hearts over the last year. You have, you have done amazing things in our life and we just, we praise you. We are grateful to you. We praise you for what you've done in our church. We praise you for the lives that are being transformed and relationships that are being restored and hearts that are being mended. And God, we just praise you for that. And Lord, we, we look forward to the vision that you have for us in 2018. We look forward to pressing in to the gospel, to bringing people and God together in love, to loving you completely, loving others unconditionally. God, we just, we just press into that and we just... We ask, God, that you would give us strength, that when we fall back and when we get distracted and when we fail and when we end up going down a a, a dark road and a, a strange path that we don't know where we're going, that you would remind us of the coordinates, that you would remind us of the vision, that you would remind us of our first love and that we would come back to you with hearts wide open. Father, we pray that you would receive all of the honor, all of the praise, all of the glory from our pursuit of you this morning and in this coming year. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.